Shalom. Uh, welcome. I'm Rabbi Scott with Beth Yeshua Messianic Synagogue in Fort Myers, Florida. We are reissuing the Revelation series that was taught by Rabbi Jim Pickens here at Beth Yeshua over the course of the last two years or so. We feel these messages are especially relevant in these tumultuous times, and we hope and pray that Adonai uses them uh, to strengthen you uh, and, and to encourage you. If you are currently a supporter of this ministry, we would like to say thank you. We appreciate your partnership with us as we all labor together in the work of the gospel of Yeshua uh, in the kingdom here on earth. Uh, if you would like to support us, you will find a link uh, below in uh, the video description. Once again, uh, we hope uh, that this is a blessing to you. If you have any questions, you will find an email address. Uh, if you have any dialogue or discussion, you'll find an email address in the video description below. Please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, now uh, I will give you the Revelation series with Rabbi Jim Pickens. Shalom. everybody. We left off last week in the middle of Daniel chapter 5 at chapter 5 verse 13 to be specific and we're going to pick this up again right there and we're going to complete chapter 5 and hopefully we'll get all the way through chapter 6 tonight so that we can begin chapter 7 next week. If we remember last week it's the year 539 BC it's the night of October 12th to 13th and Belshazzar is the king of Babylon. He's Nebuchadnezzar's son. He's Nebuchadnezzar's stepson, and he's acting as co-regent with Nebuchadnezzar, who has been captured at this point by the Persians. The Babylonian Empire is all but gone. The only thing left is just the city of Babylon itself within the city walls remaining, and it is surrounded. A seemingly impregnable fortress with more than adequate water supply, 20 years of food and wine in its storehouses, and Belshazzar is having a banquet. Historically, we know that these banquets always seem to turn into drunken orgies. After the meal and having a few cups of wine, Belshazzar orders the gold vessels that were looted from the temple in Jerusalem brought into the banquet room so that the gathered nobles, their wives, and the concubines can use them as drinking cups for their further imbibing. These are from the temple of the God of Israel, captured by his father and had been placed in the temple of Marduk, along with loot and booty from all the other sacked temples all around the empire. These, these particular vessels from the Temple of Adonai were requested by the king to be used for this particular night's debauchery. Picked, I think, because Belshazzar was an arrogant man. He knew that his father had been humbled, and he knew the prophecy of chapter 2. He knew about the statue there, and that the empire of Babylon had to come to an end because it would be replaced. Somebody he knew was going to take it over, and arrogant Belshazzar was sitting in his fortress with all the supplies he needed for 20 years of existence, in his mind, completely surrounded and blockaded. But he was, at this point, in his arrogance, shaking his fist in the face of God over the prophecy that it was going to all go away, saying, this isn't going to come true. This isn't going to come true, even though the city was now totally isolated, there was no one to come and lift the siege against them. So there they are, taking these consecrated vessels from God's holy temple, toasting their gods with them, toasting their own activities with them. And right in the middle of their orgy, a hand showed up, a detached hand. The detached hand appears and writes a message on the wall behind the king, and suddenly their liquid courage all disappeared on them. Belshazzar was so frightened it says that he could hardly stand. His knees knocked together, his legs gave way. This guy went from being stiff on wine to paralyzed with fear. Now, 
because he depended on the demonic for guidance, he calls in his seers to interpret what the hand is written on the wall. He depends on the demonic for guidance in running his empire, so he calls his seers to interpret what was happening with the handwriting on the wall. And none of these exorcists, sorcerers, magicians, astrologers, whatever you want to call them, could interpret what was written on the wall. Couldn't do it. You might say that it just wasn't in the cards for them. That really threw everyone that this couldn't be interpreted by those sages of Satan. Threw everybody in a panic over what was going on. And then the queen mother comes in. Remember the queen mom from last week? She kind of ran everything behind the scenes. The queen mother comes in and reminds them about Daniel, who is then summoned to the banquet hall. Now we have to remember that Daniel in his early 80s now, early 80s, he's an old guy. And he's no longer an integral part of the government under the new administration of Belshazzar. And that's where we left off. So we're going to pick this up in Daniel chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Daniel was brought into the king's presence. And the king said to Daniel, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles from Judah, whom the king my father brought out of Judah? I've heard about you that the spirit of the gods is in you and that you have been found to have light, discernment, and extraordinary vision. Next. Now the sages, the exorcists, were brought in to me and they, so that they could read this inscription and tell me what it means. But they couldn't interpret it for me. However, I've heard that you can give interpretations and solve naughty problems. Now if you can read the inscription, tell me what it means and you will be dressed in royal purple. Wear a gold chain around your neck and be one of three men ruling the kingdom. Belshazzar had offered these, these same status symbols of power to any one of the um, demonic sages of Babylon that could interpret this as well, and they couldn't do it. Now he was offering them to Daniel. This would have actually been reinstating Daniel, if it were perhaps bringing him back out of retirement in his old age, if he could interpret what was written on the wall. Here we also learn that Belshazzar knew a little something about Daniel. At the time of Nebuchadnezzar's death, Belshazzar was about 14 years old. Belshazzar knows of the wisdom that's available to Daniel because he'd seen him operate in his father's court. Now, wisdom of the world, so to speak, is embodied in the sages of Babylon who couldn't work anything against what was written on the wall, just failed to interpret that writing on the wall. And Belshazzar admits here that they had not been able to solve this problem that he had with this writing on the wall and what it meant and the, to the, the present time and even to the future. Now, just like the present world today, think about the present world today, Belshazzar was unwilling to seek the wisdom of God before he went completely bankrupt. Just think of our world today. No place in the world do we see the world at large basically willing to seek the wisdom of God before the world itself goes completely bankrupt. See, what's happening here is spiritual bankruptcy. Now imagine the scene here that we've just read about. Just imagine this. Daniel is now an elderly man in his 80s. A man of God is standing before a pagan king and his nobles who are full of fear, full of apprehension. They're shaken, trying to clear their minds of an alcoholic fog that they're in. And that's the scene presented as to. So still in Daniel 5, let's move on to verse 17. Daniel answered the king, keep your gifts and give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and tell him what it means. Your majesty, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, the kingdom, as well as greatness, glory, and majesty. Next. Because of the greatness he gave him, all the peoples, nations, and languages trembled with fear before him. Anyone he wanted to, he put to death. Anyone he wanted to, he kept alive. Anyone he wanted to, he advanced. Anyone he wanted to, he humbled. In other words, 
God totally empowered Nebuchadnezzar. 20. But when he grew proud and his spirit became hard and he began treating people arrogantly, so he was, he's, then he was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken away from him. He went beyond what God had said that he could do. Next. He was driven from human society. His heart was made like that of a wild animal. He lived with wild donkeys. He was fed with grass like an ox. His body was drenched with dew from the sky until he learned that the Most High God rules in the human kingdom and sets up over it whomever he pleases. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled your heart even though you knew all this. Next. Instead, you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven by having them bring you the vessels from his house. You and your lords, your wives, your concubines drank wine from them. Then you offered praise to your gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, stone, which can't see, hear, or know anything. Meanwhile, God, who holds your very breath in his hands and to whom belongs everything you do, you have not glorified. Slam dunk. Here we have Daniel, who is an elderly man at this point, before the king, who is not in real good psychological condition at the moment from his drinking, from the handwriting on the wall. And remember, this is an absolute monarch, absolute monarch. And most people were very, very careful about how they actually talked to, the, to him because if you cut him in the wrong way, he just killed you. But Daniel makes the most of this. He makes this statement to Belshazzar. First of all, Daniel disavows any interest in these gifts and rewards. Well, that's a kind of a downer. I don't care what you're offering me. That's not important. Oh, okay. Rather abruptly, he says, take these gifts and stuff them. Hmm, I couldn't care less. I've been there. I've done that, is what he's implying. Daniel understood that these were things that had value only in the world. Status symbols and political powers really only have any kind of value in the world. There was also some thoughts here among scholars that accepting these gifts would cast a shadow on the authenticity, perhaps, of his interpreting, make it a little like payola. You know, he's doing this for his own gain so he can earn something. Next, Daniel reminds the king that the God of Israel had given his father the great kingdom and the honor that went with it. And then he recounts how God had humbled Nebuchadnezzar, took him down when he got too uppity, took him down with a special kind of a mental illness until he recognized the sovereign rule of God. And Belshazzar, knew of this humiliation of his father. It would have happened during his lifetime, during a time he was visible to his father uh, being king. But the thing is, Belshazzar never learned any humility from it. He didn't learn from the lesson that his father learned from. So through the desecration of the vessels of Adonai's temple, he had exalted himself against the very God that had brought his father Nebuchadnezzar down to the lowest of low as a point of correction. Daniel's statement here clearly shows that the king was not someone that feared man. He didn't fear God. But Daniel's statement also shows, also shows clearly that he, Daniel, was someone that didn't fear man, but feared only God. See, there's a huge comparison between the two. The scripture tells us, don't fear him that can kill you. Fear him that can throw your body and soul into hell. If you want to look that up, it's Luke 12, 4 and 5. Luke 12, 4 and 5. Daniel only feared God. The charges brought against Daniel 
or the ta- the charges that Daniel brought, I guess I should say, the charges Daniel brought against the king were not done in any kind of a discourteous or insolent way, but stated in just a factual, objective way. Daniel just told the king the way it was, no sugar added. Now, we get to the interpretation. This is where it gets to be fun. Daniel 5, 24 through 28. This is why he sent the hand to write this inscription. The inscription says, Mani, Mani, Tekel, Ufarsin. This is what it means. Mani, God has counted up your kingdom and brought it to an end. There's two things going on in that verse. Mani, Mani, God has counted. Mani, your kingdom and brought it to an end. That's the count is full. Mani, Mani. 27, Tekel. You are weighed on the balance scale and come up short. And then Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. There's wordplay going on in here. I want everybody to understand that there's wordplay going on here. That last word, Usarfan, is particularly what we want to look at. These words, mani, mani, tekel, usarfin, in our Bibles are obviously transliterations. But were they Aramaic or not? Obviously cryptic, because the seers of Babylon couldn't interpret them. They could maybe have been written in an ancient form of Hebrew, allowing Daniel to read them and interpret them, that these Aramaic speakers wouldn't have understood. I want us to take note on the word play in that final word in verse 25 up here. Who farson? See that word? There's a lot of word play centered in that, if, if you will. It's the plural. That word, usarfan, is the plural of the word perez down here in verse 28. We don't have time to do a lot of language lesson tonight, but the U in Ufarsan is like a vav prefix in the Hebrew. It means and. We would say in English and parsen. Plural of Perez is what this is indicating. That leads to the word play because Perez is a lookalike word of Paraz. Paraz means Persia. Mm-hmm. Perez the singular is pointing to a singular empire taking over that is a plural in its construct. The Medes and the Persians. And the sound alike in Usarpan, Paraz, is Persia, pointing to that silver empire of the statue that follows the gold head. The number two. In any case, the visors of Babylon were blinded by God as to the meaning, but we know what is written in here. We know the interpretation of it, and that's what's important. Daniel tells us that the first two words, mani, mani, which means numbered to count up, numbered to count up, speaks of the Babylon Empire's days being number one, numbered, and having two been counted up. That number's been reached. Mani, mani. It now has to be brought to an end. The thought here is that Babylon is finished because mani, mani. You've got so many numbers in your existence, and those numbers are completed. Mani, mani. This is an absolute occurrence here. That kind of emphasis is absolute. And this brings us to what Yeshua said. Go to Luke 21, 24. Some will fall by the edge of the sword. Others will be carried into all the countries of the Goyim. And Jerusalem will be trampled down by the Goyim until the age of the Goyim has run its course. Wow. NIV says, as a complete separate sentence, quote, Jerusalem will be trampled down by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Understand that this is 
a type and foreshadow that we're seeing here because we've got another trampling down of Jerusalem that's coming in our future. The Babylonian Empire began the times of the Gentiles, but the time of the Babylonian Empire was numbered and God brought it to an end when the numbers were fulfilled. This is the picture. This is a picture. The times of the Gentiles, all four of the empires that make up the times of the Gentiles, are numbered in the same manner as Babylon's time was numbered, measured. And when that total number is reached, that's it. It's already been laid out. Predestined, if you want to say that word. That's it when you get there. It sort of gives a new meaning to to the saying, your number's up, doesn't it? Not only that, God promises that it's going to happen suddenly. When it happens, it will happen suddenly. On our way back to Daniel, let's stop at Isaiah 48, 3 for just a minute. I announced things that happened at the beginning. Long ago they issued from my mouth, I proclaimed them, then suddenly I acted and they occurred. It's interesting that Isaiah is writing this not about the Babylon that we've just been looking at, but about the Babylon of Revelation where this, he's writing about that future Babylon that Revelation speaks of where this particular passage has been inserted. It's talking about something that's going to happen at the end of the age. Anyway, this is another place in Daniel where what is to come to us in the future is foreshadowed. Mani, mani. Time has run out on Belshazzar's Babylon. It's going to end. Back in Daniel chapter 5, let's look at verse 27 where we find Pekel. You are weighed on a balance scale and come up short. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Pekio indicates being weighed, being compared to what it should measure up to. Give you a little picture to maybe help you understand this. If you're selling wares in the old days, you would have a balance. And you would place the cabbage that you were selling on one side of the balance. And then you'd add your weights to the other side of the balance until they, they leveled themselves off. And then you charged whatever the weights called for. Officials would come around with official weights of the realm to check you to make sure you were doing this exactly right. And your weights better be the same as the official weights. And it's just like this. God comes around to check us to make sure we're doing it the way he wants it done and where we're doing it better be the way he wants it done. If you're not, if you're shown to be being dishonest about what's going on, then you're in a world of trouble. See, that's the thought here. That's what's being stated here, that Belshazzar was put into the balance against the official requirements of God's realm. And he was found wanting. He fell short. He was compared with a standard and he fell short. You might consider here that Belshazzar's life hung in the balance. Now, in verse 28, Perez means divided, and we've looked at that already, but let's emphasize it here. It's plural. It's going back to the plural in verse 25 of Usarfan. You see, it's talking about the land being really divided Remember the meaning. Parson is the plural of Perez. Perez is a sound alike of Persia. It's talking about Media, Persia. The kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar has been going, be going to be given to Media, Persia. A plural kingdom. Absolutely certain that it was spoken by Daniel as an accomplished act concerning the medial Persia had already captured everything of the Babylonian Empire but the capital itself this is beginning to look more and more true particularly when you add in the aspect of 
the numbers, when you add up all the numbers, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. Nothing more to talk about. That's it. God's will is at hand. No more discussion. Daniel chapter 5, verse 29. Then Belshazzar gave the order, and they clothed Daniel in royal purple, put a gold chain around his neck, and proclaimed him that he was to be one of the three men ruling the kingdom. You know what? Belshazzar wanted somebody else to take the hit. Uh-huh. It didn't happen. That very night, Belshazzar, the king of the Kazdim, was killed. Mm-hmm. Considering what the king had been told, he acted really pretty graciously, if you think about it, towards Daniel. Gave him all that he'd promised. Now, the earlier prophecies concerning the fall of Babylon were contemptuous, really, to Belshazzar's eyes. That's why he brought those vessels of, of God out and used them to drink the wine of their orgy. But Daniel, bearing the same message to him, ended up being believed. And why not? Why not? Belshazzar had finally seen the handwriting on the wall, if you will. Then Daniel received all these honors. But like all honors of the world, they were really short-lived and useless. A new ruler was in place before morning. As Babylon had risen to power, it had conquered Jerusalem. It took its inhabitants captive. It looted and eventually destroyed its beautiful temple and the city itself. Yet what is interesting is the last official act of this pagan empire is to honor one of those children of Jerusalem, the man of God that not only predicted the downfall of this empire, but the curse of the times of the Gentiles, which has to be completed before the Son of Man returns from the heavens. Think about this. The last act of Babylon was to honor a man of God, a Jewish man of God. There's a foreshadow to be considered here. It points to the last act of the empire of man, which will be to honor the Son of God. Let's go to Zechariah, chapter 8, verse 20. Adonites of Elot says, In the future... Peoples and inhabitants of many cities will come, and the inhabitants of one city will travel to another and say, we must go to ask Adonai's favor and consult Adonites of Oot, and I'll go too. Yes, many peoples and powerful nations will come to consult Adonites of Oot in Jerusalem and ask Adonai's favor. Adonites of Oot says, when that time comes, ten men will take hold, speaking all languages of the nations, will grab hold of the cloak of a Jew and say, we want to go with you because we have heard that God is with you. This incident in Daniel 5 just frankly reeks of that. This incident in Daniel 5 is talking about Belshazzar going to come into knowledge in just a matter of hours of what this is talking about. The whole incident occurred really in just a few hours. It happened suddenly. Before morning, this empire of Babylon no longer exists. But the kingdom of God goes on forever. Daniel 5.30. That very night, Belshazzar, the king of the Kazdim, was killed. The kingdom passed to Devarish, or Darius, the Mede, when he was about 62 years old. Conventional warfare at that time would not permit entrance into that city. It was really impossible to take it by military force, except for one major flaw. The Euphrates River flowed right through the center of the city. That's what gave it its unending supply of water so they didn't have to worry about having to go outside the city flowed right under the massive walls of the city. Now, the Medio persians who had taken possession of all the property around the city were really military men, and they weren't really very dumb. And so they, on that particular night of the invasion, they diverted the river. They dug a channel around the city, and that night they diverted the river. So 
the river no longer flowed under the walls of the city, but flowed around the city. And the waters dropped where they were flowing under the walls of the city until the soldiers walked in under the walls. And so the city fell without any major destruction. They took the city essentially intact. Secular writings tell us that the medial Persian commander led his soldiers to the royal palace to get Belshazzar. And as they attacked the Babylonian guards outside, Belshazzar sent some of his guard out to see what was going on. Now we're getting this from secular writings. And as they opened the doors, then some of the Persian soldiers rushed in. When they entered, they found Belshazzar standing with his sword drawn, and they killed him and many of his nobles. Thus, Babylon fell on the night of October 13th, 539 B.C. When God's hour of judgment had finally arrived, the city was defenseless against it, regardless of the monumental of efforts of man. And again, the end happened suddenly. There, their city was impregnable. Just a few hours later, it was over. Now, as we move on to chapter 6, in chapter 6, 1, we're going to see that a new empire is in place, and Devarish, or Darius, whom we probably would most of us recognize as being Darius the Mede, comes in as its ruler, and he was about 62 years old. But as a type and foreshadow, what we need to see here is that the disaster of the world does not overtake the child of God, the Son of God, if you will, who is represented for us in Daniel. He is preserved. We need to take note of this. It's embodied, this whole idea of, of, of the child of God not being taken away from the people is embodied in Daniel, who survives and emerges as a presence in the new kingdom. I want us to see this as we start the new chapter because it's a huge type and foreshadow again. Remember that all of this is in Aramaic, and so the Gentiles could all read it. It shouldn't have come as a surprise to them. It's, it's, the message to them is that the Most High God, the God of Israel, controls the Gentile nations in every aspect of their existence. What's constantly hammered to home to us all the way through Daniel is the God of Israel controls everything that goes on in the world, including the Gentile nations. Those that are currently plotting Israel's demise really need to seriously study what God's saying in these chapters of Daniel because they're ignoring that idea that God is not in charge. Not only should they pay attention to what's going on here for the types and foreshadows that will affect them, but to find out who it is that's really in charge in the Middle East and what their future is going to be. See, it's a lesson for Gentile nations. Also, before we get into chapter 6, let's do a little background into just who was Darius the Mede, who was this Devarish that's up there. Ancient documents, now think about this, ancient documents do not record a man by this name. There's no record of anybody in history being Darius the Mede. Yet our scripture talks about him with great detail, such as his age, how he organized the new empire, the second empire that he organized, the silver part of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He came in and organized that. A 5th century B.C. historian named Herodias and other really more modern authorities on the subject agree that in ancient Persian language, Darius or Devarish was not a name of somebody, but it was a title. A title, not a proper name. And the title meant holder of the scepter. See, this was the holder of the scepter that came in and took over. 
One of the favorite views of many views was that Darius was actually a man named Gubaro, Gubaro, or Gubreus. And this would be the man that King Cyrus appointed to govern over Babylon. This man, Gubaro, was actually born about 601 uh, BCE, making him 62 years of age in 539, and he was a Mede. Hence the title here, applying, that he could have been Darius the Mede. Gubaro, who held the scepter, was the Mede. Now, what's interesting here is that each governor that Cyrus appointed replaced a formal king. Darius, the Mede holding the scepter, replaced Belshazzar. As successor to a formal king, each of these governors controlled huge, huge areas, making them, in essence, a monarch over that particular territory. And each was surrounded by a miniature court. And then there's a second view, always a second view when we look into antiquities. And that is that Darius, the Mede holding the scepter, and Cyrus were one and the same person. When we get to verse 29, we're going to see how that can be translated to support this. That the Aramaic can be translated as Darius, that is, the reign of Cyrus. Chapter 6, let's begin then with verses 1 through 3. The Varius, or Darius, decided to set over the kingdom viceroys to rule throughout the entire kingdom with three chiefs over them, of whom Daniel was one, so that these viceroys would be responsible to them and so that the king's interests would be safeguarded. And the king's interests were suddenly back to Devarish, to Darius, to the one who holds the scepter. The king's interests would be safeguarded. But because of an extraordinary spirit was in this Daniel, he so distinguished himself above the other chiefs and the viceroys that the king considered putting him in charge of the whole kingdom. Some of what, is, what this is telling us here is that the Medio Persian Empire was really very systematically organized. They had their act together. First thing they did after a conquest was establish law and order. The next thing they did was set up a system that would benefit taxation. See, money, money, money. It's always a driving force, power, and money. They would conquer a country, establish law and order, then create taxation systems where they could start draining the money out of the particular country that they had just conquered, making it submissive, ever more submissive to themselves. They also used qualified men who had served in their old kingdom that they had just taken over. This was common. And the Medes did what they could to set up a friendly relationship with the people that were under their power, like the old Babylon. Even some of the gods of Babylon were honored. That's how far they'd go. Now, the organization of the new ruler was detailed in the opening verses here. It says there were 120 viceroys. Esther 1.1 says that there were 127 provinces, so evidently, Business picked up a little bit between Daniel and Esther. But 120 viceroys, rulers of these individual provinces, answered to three chiefs under Darius, one of whom was Daniel. This was a powerful position that Daniel held, a position provided by God to Daniel to serve. Remember, God establishes who gets to rule. The gifts of God that had, he had bestowed on Daniel were s tremendous. Daniel performed in a superior manner. It states here that Daniel had an extraordinary spirit in him. Of course, Ruach HaKodesh, supernatural enablement. He was an honest and capable administrator, which is probably why his fellow servants were out to get him, after all. How can we nibble and pull in our bit that we're siphoning off the top if this guy isn't? 
We've got to make him be like one of us. Daniel 6, verse 4. The other chiefs and the viceroys tried to find a cause for complaint against Daniel in regard to how he performed his governing duties, but they could find nothing to complain about. No fault. On the contrary, he was so faithful, not a single existence of negligence or faulty administration could be found. Then these men said, we're not going to find any cause for complaint against this Daniel unless we can find something against him in regard to the law of his God. They're going to tiptoe in where no man should tread, where all men should fear to tread. They couldn't find anything to, to bring against Daniel, so they decided to trump something up against him. Here we have Daniel as a man of God, elevated into a high position in the pagan world through the action of his God. And that's, of course, being in this high position is not without its consequences. Those under him wanted him disposed of permanently, and they had to devise a scheme. And the only possible thing that they could attack, that they could find that they could attack him through, would be his faithfulness to his God. That faithfulness was a predictable pattern in Daniel's behavior. They could count on him doing specific things that he always did in his faithfulness to his God. And reading between the lines, this is really an extraordinary statement because we're coming into that already today. There's already legislation going on all over this country and everything from cities to state capitals to, to the nation itself where those that are faithful to God are ultimately going to be held accountable for that faith. Things are going to be used against them. It's going, they're going to ultimately, we're going to be ultimately criminally and accountable. Just keep watching because it's already starting. Don't know how many years it'll take us to come to this, but this is what it really was then. Criminal accountability is what they were going to get Daniel for, and that criminal accountability had to do with his worship of his Lord. They would pass a law that if Daniel was faithful to his God, that was a criminal act, punishable by death. When we get into Revelation, we're going to need to think more about that. Keep that in mind. So let's now look at Daniel chapter 6, verse 6. We're going to look at 6 through 10. So these chiefs and viceroys descended on the king and said to him, King Devarish, live forever. All the king, chiefs of the kingdom along with the prefects, viceroys, advisors, and governors have met and agreed that the king should issue a decree putting in force the following law. Whoever makes a request of any god or man during the next 30 days except of you, your majesty, is to be thrown into the lion's pit. Now, your majesty, issue this decree over your signature so that it cannot be revoked as required by the law of the Medes and the Persians, which is itself irrevocable. So King Devari signed the document, and the decree became law. On learning that the document had been signed, Daniel went home. The, ups the windows of his upstairs room were opened in the direction of Jerusalem, and there he kneeled down three times a day and prayed, giving thanks before his God, just as he had been doing before. Hmm. Everybody got together and ganged up on Daniel. He was in the way of their devious schemes because of the laws of his God. So they all got together, drafted a royal statute, a firm decree, and they were taking advantage of two things. Number one, Daniel's predictable behavior concerning his God, and two, a unique characteristic of Persian law from a book entitled Our Oriental Heritage by Will Stewart we find quote it was the proud boast of Persia that its laws never changed and that a law promise or decree was irrevocable in his edicts and judgments the king supposed to be inspired by 
In his edicts and judgment, the king was supposed to be inspired by the god Ohura Mazda himself. Therefore, the law of the realm was the divine will of that god, and any infraction of it was an offense to the deity. That will give us an idea of the impact of this law, the basis of this law against Daniel and against the God of man, against the man of God as he worships his God. See, spiritual warfare is going on. This delegation, first of all, lied to the king when they told him all the officials had made a unanimous decision after consultation together. Daniel was one of the three top officials, and he wasn't even consulted in this. But then we've seen some Supreme Court cases in this country that were based on some lies, haven't we? This goes on. The statute involved this, that anyone would make a religious request of any god or man except through the king for the next 30 days should be cast into a lion's den, effectively executed. And the effect of this for Darius was he would be regarded as the only representative of the deity for a month. Now, this appealed to the king's vanity. It was just too much for him. He succumbed to it immediately. It appears that the law had already been drafted, literally pushed under his nose for signature. The conspirators really didn't want to give him time to think this one over. Time was at the essence for the success of this scheme. The king allowed himself to be trapped into the plot. The law was signed and put into effect. Daniel 6, 11. Then these men descended on Daniel and found him making requests and pleading before his God. <laughs> What's made clear here is that Daniel knew that the law was in effect when he went into his room to pray. We just saw that in the message above. Now, why did he have the window open in his room in the direction of Jerusalem? He did this, I believe, in accordance to the prayer of Solomon. When Solomon was dedicating the temple of God, the first temple, during his dedication he had a prayer which says in part, quote, if they sin against you, talking of the people of Israel, quote again, for there, <coughs> for there is no one who doesn't sin and you are angry with them, hand them over to the enemy so that they are carried away captive Hmm. to the land of their enemy, which is far away or nearby. Then if they come to their senses in the land where they have been carried away captive, turn back and make their plea to you in the land of those who carried them away as captive, saying we've sinned, we've acted wrongly, we've behaved wickedly, and in the land of their enemies who carried them off captive, they return to you with all their heart and their being, and they pray to you, toward their own land. And they pray to you toward their own land, which you gave them toward the city you chose and towards the house that you built for your name. And what Daniel was doing was following the instructions of the prayer of Solomon. He'd been carried off ca captive and he was praying towards the land, the city, and where the temple should be located. Daniel could have avoided all this. The decree didn't prohibit prayer, only that if you did pray, it had to be to the king as representative of the pagan deity. See, Daniel simply could have backed away from his window and kept praying. Daniel didn't do that. And Daniel was not courting Babylon. He wasn't interested in Babylon, other than what God had him doing. He actively continued to pray in the face of the king's decree, a continuation of his faithful ministry and his faithful prayer to God, which had characterized his long life at this point. Daniel was not a fair-weather child of God who would only serve God in good times in the 
convenient times or in those times where there was no cost involved in his doing his serving, he had his windows open and he prayed a lot. Makes you think of, quote, let your light so shine before man that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. He's projecting it out for everybody to see. Matthew 5.16, by the way, is the quote on that. There was no attempt to avoid detection. Daniel prayed to God, gave him thanks. He did what was right and trusted God for the results. Then the predictable occurred. Daniel was found praying by these men who wanted to get rid of him, praying directly before his God instead of before the king. The trap was sprung. Daniel 6.12. So they went to remind the king of his royal decree. Didn't you sign a law prohibiting anyone from making requests of any god or man within 30 days except yourself, your majesty, on pain of being thrown in the lion's pit? And the king answered, yes, that is true, as required by the laws of the Medes and Persians, which is itself irrevocable. And they replied to the king that Daniel, one of the exiles from Judah, respects neither you, your majesty, nor the decree you signed. Instead, he prays three times daily. He continues praying three times a day. When the king heard this report, he was very upset. He determined to save Daniel and worked until sunset to find a way to rescue him. The king liked Daniel. But these men descended on the king and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that it is law of the Medes and Persians that no decree or edict once issued by the king can be revoked. So the king gave the order. They brought Daniel and threw him in the lion's pit. But look at that last line. The king said to Daniel, Your God, whom you are always serving, will save you. <laughs> Evidence... Evidence in hand of the plotters. Evidence in the hands of the plotters go to the king and they remind him the royal decree concerning prayer. And the first thing they do is confirm that the decree was signed in the law. Then they bring the accusations against Daniel. They present evidence of Daniel's violation of the new law. It's interesting that the conspirators show their contempt for Daniel. They show this by identifying him not as one of the three leaders just below the king, the holder of the scepter, which he was, but as being that exile from Judah. And this exile not only violated the statute, but he prayed to his God three times a day in doing that. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? He prayed to his God three times a day. The effrontery of this man. The king knew he'd been had. He saw that he'd been tricked and he saw the purpose of the decree, but instead of focusing his anger on Daniel, as Nebuchadnezzar had really focused his on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he saw that he'd made a mistake and tried to find a loophole in the law. The law was airtight. The king's labors were in vain. He worked the entire day, but didn't get anywhere. The evening came, the spirits assembled before the king and reminded him that the law could not be changed. The punishment must be enacted. It must be enacted that evening that the accusation is made according to their custom. And so the king had to act. Verse 17 and 18. A stone was brought to block the opening of the pit. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring and the signets of his lords so that nothing concerning Daniel could be changed. Then the king returned to his palace. He, re he spent the night fasting and refused to be entertained. His sleep eluded him. Note a very interesting thing. Darius had said, back up in verse 16, your God, whom you serve continuously, will save you. A better translation might be that he must deliver you. The God that you serve continuously must deliver you because I can't. I can't. I'm lost in this. 
What the king is saying here is, I can't deliver you from this mess I've got in your land. I've tried everything. I've failed, but your God must now save you. It appears that Daniel's life was such a witness to Darius that it impressed Darius to the point that he had these convictions that Daniel's God would come to his rescue. Daniel had been a pretty good witness. Daniel was cast into the lion's den. The stole ro stone rolled into place, sealed by both the king's signet and that of the conspirators. Nothing or no one could interfere with this. And just a brief description of the lion's den for you, what it looked like. There'd be a large square cavern under the earth having a partition wall, and in the middle of that wall was a door. And how it worked was that uh, lions would go into the side where the food was, and then the closing of the door would allow access to the other side in safety. So people could move around in with a certain safety, but if that door was opened, all bets was off. And they opened the door on Daniel, who was the food. Mm. Daniel sixteen nineteen. Early in the morning, the king got up and hurried to the lion's pit. Approaching the pit where Daniel was, the king cried out in a pained voice to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you are always serving, been able to save you from the lions? Then Daniel answered the king, may the king live forever. Note the concern of Darius. Remember, this man is used to brutality and execution of criminals. He didn't get where he was by being a nice guy. But Daniel's condition had affected Darius emotionally. He couldn't eat. He couldn't sleep. He didn't want to be entertained. Probably a first on that. As soon as it was daylight, he was up and out the door, hastened to the lion's den, and called in a hesitant manner to Daniel. Note that he refers to Daniel here as the servant of the living God. This is certainly different from the way the conspirators referred to Daniel. There is asked the question in a troubled manner, has the God whom you are always serving been able to deliver you from the lions? The king's faltering faith is shown in the manner in which he asked the question. He called out in a pained voice. As the king feared here in the reply would be only silence or a growl or maybe just a belch, but Daniel answered, <laughs> May the king live forever. Verse 22, please. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so they couldn't hurt me. This is because of him that I was found innocent, and also I have done no harm to you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered Daniel taken up from the pit. So Daniel was taken up from the pit, and he was found to be completely unarmed because he had trusted in his God. Then the king gave an order, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they threw them in the lion pit, them, their children, their wives. And before they even reached the bottom of the pit, the lions had them in their control and broke all their bones into pieces. What the king actually heard in reply was not some panic-stricken voice pleading to be taken out of there, but a calm voice of Daniel. The calm voice of Daniel had given the king his usual courteous greeting. Then Daniel informed the king that the God of Israel had preserved him through an angel that had come and shut the mouths of the lions because in the eyes of God he was innocent of any crime against God and the king. Wow. Some believe that Daniel was lifted up by ropes so that the seals in the door would remain unbroken. <laughs> this is was so no accusation could be made about him being rescued during the night. Daniel was examined, and not a scratch was found on him. Another type in poor shadow. Think about this. The stone was rolled away, and Daniel was alive. When the stone was rolled away, the tomb was found empty. No one dead in it. The trickery and deceit of Daniel's accusers had promptly been rewarded here. They and their families were thrown into the lion's den where Daniel had just been pulled out of. To include the families of those found guilty was a common practice at that time. It was to prevent really any future assassination attempts against the king by disgruntled relatives. 
Our passage reports that the lions intercepted these people before they even reached the bottom. The ferocity of the lions emphasizes the miraculous delivery of Daniel. It also silences critics who have said these were just a bunch of harmless, toothless old pussycats that were in there. That's how Daniel made it out. They couldn't hurt a fly. Well, this chapter ends with a decree that's really in the form of a psalm or a hymn. Daniel 6, 25, please. King Devarish wrote all the peoples, nations, languages living anywhere on earth. Shalom Rav, abundant peace. I herewith issue a decree that everywhere in my kingdom people are to tremble and be in awe of the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. He endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed. His rulership will last until the end. He saves, rescues, does signs and wonders both in heaven and on earth. He delivered Daniel from the power of lions. So, this Daniel prospered during the reign of Delarish and also during the reign of Koresh, the Persian. So let's ask the question. Why was Daniel put through this? Well, these verses give us the answer. Scripture says, My strength is made perfect in weakness, 2 Corinthians 12.9. And God's strength was made perfect through Daniel. Just as a weak human being who would have been killed by those lions, God's strength prevented it. This decree went out of Tavarish, of the king, throughout all the known world, directing all men to tremble before the living God, the one that endures forever, the one whose kingdom will not be destroyed, whose dominion will be forever. A God who delivers and rescues, performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. What a testimony to the pagan Gentiles. The inclusion of the rescue of Daniel here is almost anticlimactic. But note that the king stopped short of acknowledging that the God of Israel was the only God. Oh, yeah. But think of how many people might have come into a relationship with the God of Israel because of this proclamation that that king issued. Verse 28 is a testimony to God that Daniel prospered following all this during the reign of Darius and Cyrus, Navarish and Koresh. This verse, as we mentioned earlier, could point to either Cyrus succeeding the one with the scepter are both being alive at the same time. Darius serving under Cyrus, being someone of a name other than Darius. All depending on how this is translated. Think for a minute of the story of Daniel in the lion's den. The disdain for Daniel's lifestyle, the plot and the laws that put Daniel in danger and God's sovereign rescue. See, this is all kind of going to repeat itself, and there will be a coming sovereign rescue of God. Life during the days of the book of Daniel reflect to a degree what it's going to be like to have life during the days of the book of the Revelation. And the end for the faithful in the book of the Revelation, like in Daniel, will be the safety provided by God. But it's going to require this kind of faith that's exhibited by Daniel when we get to the end of the age in the Revelation. And not everybody's going to be rescued like Daniel because there will be a lack of faith. There'll be a lack of understanding. Now what we've just finished here in chapter 6 concludes the chronological narrative of Daniel's life and the outside influences that affected him during that chronological time of his life. Doesn't finish us with Daniel. We're going to continue with Daniel, just changing the chronological narrative. Starting with next week in chapter 7, we're going to look into things that are inner influences of Daniel's life, but out of the chronological order.
These will include Daniel's own visions. These coming pas passages will have a lot of chronological displacement take place in them. Being set out separately for the point of emphasis, we'll point that out as we go through. Literary style, very common in the writing of the ancient peoples, is what we're going to see. Next week, we start chapter 7. Thank you. <laughs>